now pivot and take that idea of the so let's take that idea of coastal or, or de defining things and let's let's spend some time um, thinking about the um, the areas that we that we don't traditionally think about and that would be the stuff that's that's in the ocean underwater etc so I want to talk about the different provinces of the ocean. This is coastal and marine management, right? We, we focus on the coastal aspect of, of coastal marine management. But we, we definitely need to understand some of the basics of the marine world to properly have these conversations about fisheries and other things. Okay, we have a whole host of management relevant geographies that we could um, talk about. So I'll start with this. One of the things that changed on September the 11th is the notion that we're protected by oceans. In the past, uh, uh, conflict would take place in remote lands. We felt pretty secure at home. Okay, so um, we obviously just had the, and the anniversary of 9-11. Um, but that notion is constantly trotted out. I know no one that thought that. I was alive during this time. I know no one that thought that we were isolated and protected from the rest of the world, and that our oceans protected us. That was an idea from World War I. Um, but the fact remains, in popular culture at least, that notion of, wow, the ocean sets us apart and everything. It's this vast, unknowable thing that's a massive boundary. Um, uh, that, that does have purchase, right? In the, in the general public's idea, especially for folks that don't think much or don't work in and around the oceans of the world. It, it, it is an amorphous thing. I don't really know about it. So let's talk about some of the geography of land versus the geography of stuff in the ocean. On, on land, um, much of what we see in terms of um, landscapes, in terms of the, the topography, is a political or a legal construct, right? And so here we look at the city, we look at the Greater Los Angeles Basin, and this is this is a night this is a new nighttime shot from NASA. This is just streets and street lights, right? All of that is constructed. We've decided where we want the streets to go. We've decided where we're going to run the power lines to, for example. Um, we could talk about um, the distribution of different uh, aspects of the landscape that already exist before us. So, for example, wetlands. So here's our Ventura County, uh, our overlay of Ventura County wetlands. Um, and so we see the Santa Clara River, we see uh, um, Cayugas Creek and those things. You know, obviously we could talk about is this area a wetland or not, or is it a riparian corridor or not, based on... Um, uh, the, di the existing distribution of that aspect of the surface of the earth. And then we could do something like take, which what we've done actually in Ventura County, uh, the first in the U.S. to do this and was legally, legally defended finally, um, upheld in court uh, earlier this year. So the first, the first trotted out in the U.S. and the first legally upheld wildlife corridors as a planning tool as a planning overlay in the county of Ventura. So you guys shall be very proud of yourselves that you live in this place. Um, but for example, um, the, the uh, gray there would, is the um, uh, incorporated areas of, of various cities in the county. And then the green is the area that we have used to define um, a region where the, the um, guide on, guidelines of wildlife corridors matter. And the core of that was the riparian corridors, was, was the distribution of wetlands. But then we sort of you know, did some additional stuff to it, looked at how animals moved, et cetera. And so we can have that kind of a geography defined. Are we, quote unquote, in a wildlife corridor? Or are we, quote unquote, not in a wildlife corridor, et cetera? And you can see, um, uh, yeah, so you can see. So Liberty Canyon, which is over here, the big famous one, the one that, will, that is being built right now, that maybe some of you are, have been working on. Um, that is going to be the, the largest, most expensive wildlife crossing in the world um, over the 101. But we're also now working on another one right here on the Conejo Grade, um, which, will, which will join these two clumps, these two green clumps. So um, anyway, so wildlife corridors are an example. And then 
uh, one thing that, that the coastal the coastal um, act created in addition to creating the coastal zone by definition it also created this term called in, uh, called ESHA or the acronym is ESHA environmentally sensitive habitat areas um, and these are uh, coastal sage scrub and other things of that nature so we could we could we could do that we could go and count ah oh, is this plant here is this mountain lion moving through this landscape and we could chop up or we could define our areas by that and indeed we we have do that we have done that and we do that commonly in the terrestrial world so Esha, this is the definition of Esha, but but it's it's an it's an area where uh, plant or animal life or their habitats are either rare or especially valuable because of their special nature or role in an ecosystem and which could be easily disturbed or degraded by human activity so things that are in the coastal zone that that you know if we if we put a building there nearby or something like that could could um, negatively impact them okay now let's pivot and talk about the oceanic realm and what's going on in that place right so we have um, much less specificity relative to the terrestrial world right the terrestrial world we have all these things we have wildlife corridors and we have Esha and we have all these things don't by and large have the same thing um, mostly in the ocean it's components of the natural world and existing topographies define um, how we how we construct the areas of the ocean um, we're looking at here we're looking at some bioluminescence oh, okay, it's a little dark but so we're looking at some bioluminescence here uh, uh, in Santa Monica Bay uh, if it was dark and you can see that okay let's start with an exaggerated cross-section of the 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 a generic ocean basin okay and so these are these are some terms you guys should be familiar with understand so on the left side of the screen that's the that's that's land that's us that's a continent that's that's Ventura County let's say as we progress to the right of the figure we're gonna go um, away from land we're gonna go into the ocean so we can let's let's talk about the benthos let's talk about the bottom of the ocean so we start off here and we're on we're we're on land and then we get to this area where it's a it's a relatively gentle slope and that's known as the continental shelf um, and then after a while we're gonna go and there's gonna be a, a pretty steep change in the rate of that slope and it's gonna be much more dramatic and that is um, uh, the continental slope. Yeah, I said slope. I, yeah, I used, I used the, the name and the definition. So we have the, the shelf, and then we have the slope. Is why I should have said that. And then at the bottom of the slope is the toe, or the bottom of that area where essentially debris has built up. That's called the rise, and it, it changes the angle. You can't see much in this, in this image here, but the angle changes. And then it basically becomes flat. This big, broad, giant abyssal plain that is the most common feature of the world's oceans by, by area. And that's just a big flat plain, roughly. Every so often, this broad flat plain is interrupted. Sometimes interrupted to go deeper, sometimes interrupted to go higher. The deeper things are called trenches, rents in the bottom. Oftentimes those are associated with, uh, or typically those are associated with um, uh, continental plates. And then uh, we can have the deposition of new rock, new material, and, and if it happens enough, it actually rises from the bottom of that abyssal plain into a volcanic island. And then sort of in between those two uh, is something called a, a ridge, uh, so a, an oceanic ridge, which are, again are where two, uh, two plates are coming together, smashing up against each other typically. So we have continental shelf, slope, rise, plain, and then we have these, these other structures. Much of, the, much of the most interesting coastal management challenges tend to happen in the continental shelf. I mean, we have challenges all across the planet, but, but that's where the most productive fisheries typically are. That's where we want to do our oil and gas drilling. That's where people want to you know, have shipping traffic concentrated coming in across the, the globe, et cetera. So, so anywhere is important, but the continental shelf is where a, a huge amount of our attention is, is concentrated. Um, so how would you 
Yeah, that's all show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so these here are these provinces if we're talking about um, areas by depth, the bottom of the ocean. Okay. So we have the continents, you and I are on the continent, right? We have the shelf, and the, and much of the shelf, not not all, but much of the shelf was exposed at one point or another. Higher sea level, lower sea level, right? Things have changed over time. Um, essentially, the continental shelf is, a, is just an extension of what, where we are. It just, just so happens the water levels, whatever the water level is right now. But otherwise, similar. Um, the slope uh, is, is, you know, while it varies, it's on average about four degrees in terms of that, the, the, the drop off. Uh, the continental rise you mentioned is just sort of like the, the debris pile at the bottom, at the toe of, of that slope. Bissell Plain, the ridges, and the trenches. Okay, so um, I like this. This isn't, this isn't California, but I, I just always like this uh, illustration. I, I've just not found an equivalent good one that I like, or an, a nice artsy one. But this is the East Coast, right? So we see Cape Cod right here. But it sort of serves, it serves to make the point, right? That a lot of times, like what, what President Bush was saying there is, oh, the ocean is this huge thing, and it starts at the shoreline, and we were protected. Da, da, da. There really is a lot of complex stuff going on here. So even though we might be at the at the edge of where the water is meeting the air right here, um, it could be quite shallow. And again, as we mentioned, much of the shelf, the only reason it's underwater is because sea level rise, but the rest of it is very similar to our topography. It's a continuation of the stuff on land, right? When we get to the slope right here, that's a very different thing, right? That's like we're going off the cliff. We're, we're going to very different territory. Um, and then we have the, 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 you know, the bottom of the ocean, the abyssal plain. Okay, how are we gonna manage? How are we, how are we gonna govern these <coughs> oceanic realms? <coughs> so a couple different um, regions we can talk about. You might sometimes in old readings or old uh, news articles or whatever, hear about territorial seas. That's, that's, a, that's a not well-defined term and was defined differently by different countries. So it, it's, it's not really a great term. Um, it's like whoever had the biggest gun, that was my, that was my territory. So this is mine kind of thing. Um, um, you might also hear about exclusive economic zones, which is fairly commonly still used in, um, in economic circles, people calculating uh, GDPs and things of that nature. Um, but it's, it tends to be old. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll just say that. So the outer continental shelf is referring to areas beyond three nautical miles. So in... For example, in the U.S., since we use that three nautical miles as the definition of what is a state controlled versus federal controlled, this would be the outer continental shelf. So still relatively shallow, but controlled by the feds in our case, right? And as you mentioned, because the continental shelf is where a lot of the interesting action is, where the easy to drill, you know, easy to get to oil deposits, lots of abundant shallow water fish, that kind of stuff. Um, relatively easy to, to do some kind of deep sea mining in those areas, for example. It's not technically deep sea, but uh, subtitle mining, um, all that kind of stuff. That We'd call that the outer continental shelf. Huge with regards to our agency here in Camarillo that manages, the, um, that used to be known as the MMS, the Minerals Management Service. Um, now is BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They spend a lot of time worrying about putting in things like wind turbines. We're putting wind turbines in the outer continental shelf, not out in the middle of the ocean. Um, the extended continental shelf is beyond 200 nautical miles, and 200 nautical miles is the general definition for uh, um, the, the waters of, the, the ocean controlled by um, a country. So these, these use these old terms of nautical mile. What the heck's a nautical mile? It was originally defined as one minute of latitude or one... 160th of a degree. Somebody asked me the other day, when we were talking about nautical miles, like, what was the definition of that? And I couldn't remember. This is the definition. It was 160th of a degree. 
um, we define it now as 1,852 meters, or a little, a uh, little more than uh, one and a tenth mile, uh, a statutory mile. Um, and I'll just say, when you're looking at maps and different UN documents and things, there, there's inconsistencies for how we define nautical mile. It's it's just a problematic unit. It's just it's just confusing to people. We don't we don't use it in in, in common um, measurement. And it's just an anachronism, but that's what we're stuck with. So the most common one would be NM, but it's, yeah, it's not always consistent. Okay, so let, let's look again at this. So here's our, here's our shelf versus the slope. So we have the continental shelf, right? Uh, and, uh, and this is an example. So this is a, this, this meaning 350 nautical miles um, is, is always going to be in this particular location. This is just a, a diagram, right, to illustrate, illustrate the point um, of how far we are in terms of nautical miles. Um, the legal geography is, is, uh, follows a lot of that stuff. So here are some examples um, from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which we'll talk more about later. Um, but uh, these are uh, terms that should be, should be, make sense to you now. So deep ocean floor is abyss. Uh, morphological continental shelf is the continental shelf. Um, the slope is the slope, etc. Here is our uh, so-called exclusive economic zone, this sort of bit of an old, somewhat mushy term. But um, this is our exclusive economic zone, sometimes just referred to as the EEZ. So this is the US, right? So if we look at this, our EEZ is huge. So first and foremost, it's that 200 nautical miles that, that makes sense, right? That goes off of our mean higher high water. So it's here and here and stuff, right? That, that makes sense. But then a like, huge area out in the Pacific uh, around the Hawaiian Islands. To be clear, when you think of the Hawaiian Islands, you are thinking of the main Hawaiian Islands, but the Hawaiian Island archipelago extends for thousands of miles. And so most of those areas uh, out uh, west of Kauai and Niihau are not occupied by people. They're, they're bird reserves and, and things of that nature. Um, but nevertheless, they are still quote unquote US territory. And so therefore, for every one of those little islands, the, the EEZ extends out, you know, it, 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 it encircles that area. And the Marianas and all these other islands, right? Um, most of these uh, we we obtained in World War II, right? In in the beating back of um, uh, the Imperial Japanese forces, and then we just decided we're going to keep them. So we have a, a pretty large exclusive economic zone. Let's talk about uh, another way we can define the ocean is by um, location. So we can talk about, and I'll define these things in a second, we can talk about neuritic versus oceanic, pelagic versus benthic, um, uh, and then movement of, of critters is another way to, to talk about things in the ocean that while this isn't a, a habitat or a place, it is actually important you guys understand this. And this would be the notion of self-powered, self-moving through the ocean versus primarily my movement dictated, dictated by the currents and how the water is moving, and I'm just sort of along for the ride. We can talk about stuff being um, uh, near or far from an edge of something, and we can. And then the another common one is to talk about: Are we in the lit region of the ocean or the dark area of the ocean? So let's let's look at these different terms. Okay. So, and here, another, another generic diagram. So, okay, for, first let me talk about this. Okay, so supra, let's, so supra tidal is above, above the tide, right? So the tide is a daily changing of the water, going high, going low, going high, going low. Supra tidal is the area above that. And then things at or near the shoreline are littoral or littoral. Right, as, as a general phrase, it can be applied to stuff. So we can talk about, um, uh, you know, a littoral economy or a literal economy. Um, 
And so we have stuff that's pelagic in the water or stuff that's attached of or associated with the bottom, the benthic. And then we have a huge host of biological resources that are associated with some of these, these structures in the ocean. And so the most common one would be a place-based name for critters in the ocean that you should know about. So things, so critters that live at or either attached to just inside, like maybe worms crawling through the sediment, or, or might not be attached but are, are tightly associated with the bottom would, are, are things of the benthos or benthic critters. Okay. On the other side of the spectrum, if we're talking about stuff that's right up at the skin of the ocean, the air-water interface, those critters that live there are nuston. And then things that are not nustonic, that are not at the skin and not in the, uh, you know, hanging out in the sediments that are in between, those are either going to be referred to as nekton or planktonic crit critters. Plankton are critters that are primarily moving around based on currents. So think uh, algae, like little single-celled algae. Nekton are things that can relatively easily uh, determine for themselves where they want to go. They might, they might be dispersed by currents, but if they don't want to go that way, they don't have to go that way. What would, be, what would Nekton be? A whale, a fish, right? That kind of thing. So we have benthic critters, of or associated with the bottom, Nekton, big swimming around things. Plankton, things that are moving based on the currents, primarily. And then Nuston, things that are right at the, the skin of the ocean.